This is Unsilo brought to you by Alumni FM, connecting people through stories. Welcome to Unsiloed. I'm Greg LeBlanc, and I'm here today with uh, Didier Bonnet, who is a professor of strategy and digital transformation at IMD, and also former executive vice president at consulting firm Cap Gemini. Um, welcome, Didier. Um, oh, I forgot to mention also that you are the author of, co author of this book right here, uh, Leading Digital Turning Technology into Business Transformation. Now, DDA, this book is about seven years old, and I think it was about 2014 when I started getting a huge number of requests, particularly from uh, European companies around this topic of digital transformation. So it wasn't simply that they were looking for uh, insight into innovation or into um, strategy. They, they, they had something very specific in mind, which was this thing called digital transformation. And it's been, you know, it's been seven years and, and you've argued in some places that uh, there's, there's been, you know, a lot of hype around digital transformation. There's been a lot of misconceptions uh, around it uh, that we've now entered into like a second wave of digital transformation. Uh, and, and you've even, I think made, made the point that like, you know, maybe it, it doesn't even make sense to talk about it because at this point, you know, everything is, is digital or should be, or, you know, at least if you've survived this long, you've probably done something. <laughs> so maybe we could should back up and just say, Hey, so, you know, why, what is this, what is it about digital transformation? Why, why aren't we just talking about kind of, you know, innovation in general, or, you know, strategy in general, or, you know, good management in general? Why, why, why is it that we need to really, really remind people that, you know, tech is, is the biggest story in business as you, as right. you highlight in the book? Yeah. yeah, I think, I think what's, what, um, you know, what the complexity is, I think is that like, we, we mustn't forget that, you know, digital transformation is a business transformation first, which is fueled by a lot of smart technology, but it's a business transformation. And like all business transformation, the, the, it's hard to put a boundary around it because it does include strategy and operation improvement and change management. And, uh, you know, there's a people angle and there's a, so, so, so it's kind of a fairly broad, uh, in its structure. And, and, and this is kind of what led us to the first research, uh, and the book was basically, you know, how do we get our head around this as a, as an executive to try to, as you know, to try to even decide what do I do in my own enterprise? So, so the idea with the, with the first book was really to, um, put up some boundaries and some frameworks to say, how, how do I even start thinking? uh, through this problem. So I can start, uh, you know, doing some, uh, practical things in my organization. Uh, and, but as you say, it, it does span from, you know, some good strategy thinking. So you come, you, you know, I mean, one of the things we've seen over the last decade is, you know, people doing digital transformation as a, as a default thing to do, you know, it's, it's become kind of a, a, a corporate fashion statement, you know, so, uh, mm -hmm. and, and I think, you know, the, the, uh, if we go back to the principle of strategy, you have to make choices, uh, you have to allocate resources. I mean, that's what it's all about. So, so the, why you're doing it, uh, to me is still as important today as, as it ever was. Uh, but then you of course have, you know, the technology, which is, um, in the middle of all this, and it's incredibly important because obviously you cannot do digital transformation without making smart investment in the technology itself. But if that was the only part of transformation, then the richer company would always win, right? The, whoever has got more capital to invest in technology will, will, will win. And it's not what we found in the research. We found that, uh, you know, a second dimension, which was, uh, equally as important is, is this notion of how you actually transform your organization for this technology. So how do people work differently? I do want my processes evolve and, uh, and, and, and really that was the kind of the start of, uh, you know, thinking for a framework that could help executive to sort of get going on this, on this journey of, of transformation. Well, the first step in, in you have sort of a playbook, which, which I liked it, but the first step in the playbook is really about creating awareness of kind of what the challenge is. And, you know, you mentioned that a lot of companies will 
maybe take their senior executive team and run them through some experience, right? Some, you know, immersion experience or where they, they get this, you know, shock and awe. I, I like to think that that's, that's part of what I do with, um, companies that come to Silicon Valley is, you know, you give them a shock and awe and say, oh, look at this, you know, and look what, uh, but, but typically what, what you'll do sometimes is you'll, you'll show them, well, this is what Google's doing and this is what Amazon is doing. And this is what Facebook is doing, um, or Salesforce, but you, you target, you say, look, 95% of the companies out there are, are not those companies, right? And they're, they're never going to be the, those companies, right? And so for those companies laying out what the challenge is, right? How do you do that? How do you tell them, Hey, look, you know, here's what you need to think about. Here's what you need to look like. You need a vision. This is what you need to look like in the future, but it's not, you know, necessarily, uh, you're going to look like Google. Right. How do you, how do you build that, that awareness? And, and then how do you also emphasize that, that this is really a, a leadership challenge as much as a technology challenge? Yes. So it's uh, there are many questions. <laughs> I think you, you know, we, we, you're, you're quite right. I think part of the, I, I guess the, the awareness part was more important, um, you know, when we started the research some, some six, seven years ago, I mean, today, you know, pretty much every executive I meet you know, within five seconds, you're talking about digital transformation. And, and I think as you mentioned earlier, it's got to the point where, you know, is it actually meaningful because you have, uh, you know, people who provide cloud software services, uh, uh, claiming to be doing digital transformation. You have automation company claiming to do digital transformation. So everyone is doing digital transformation to the point where I think it's lost a little bit of its, uh, of, of, of its, uh, you know, meaning. Uh, to some extent. So I think, you know, I'm always arguing for going back to first principle to say, okay, mm -hmm. what, what do you actually do on Monday morning? And, and I think all the, the points you raise about, um, raising awareness by taking executives to Silicon Valley or, or, or wherever, I think it, we've seen a lot of that and, and I've seen, um, you know, great successes and, and to some extent, more tourism than, than leadership change, you know, uh, because it's, you know, as you say, you, you know, companies like Google and Apple probably have dedicated departments, to, uh, nowadays to receive these people, you know, so, so you're, 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 first of all, uh, you're, you're not looking at companies that were created like you. And, and this is a reason why, uh, in the book, we excluded startups and we excluded tech company, not because we don't love them, but, but because we wanted to focus on company who have a heritage and a large legacy, whether it's processes, people, culture, uh, you know, some of these companies are over 200 years old. So we wanted to see how do you actually move, you know, tankers, uh, uh, towards this digital world, uh, rather than try to say, you know, the usual Googleize yourself or become mm. Uber or you know, all these kind of slogan that we've heard, uh, over and over. And, and, and as you point out, it's very hard because, um, you know, how do you start thinking of a strategy for your digital, uh, transformation, if you're an executive that has very little technology mm. understanding. So I think that's where the education and the leadership becomes really important. Uh, and I would say. It's even true for boards of directors, you know, I mean, you find on, on boards of directors, people that have really never been exposed, uh, to some of these technologies. So I think that to me, where, where the learning is important from a leadership perspective is not become a, a technologist, but at least have a, gr a good understanding of what this te technology can do for your business and how, do, how you can improve your business. And that's, that's really why. Uh, I, I have seen some successes in, 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 in some organization where the, the entire board has actually been to, uh, you know, some of these bedrock of, of innovation, whether it's in, in, uh, California, but you know, some people go to Asia nowadays to, to have the same sort of experience. So this immersive experience are, are, are really useful. I would say the most useful I've seen is when you have time to debrief amongst you, uh, amongst yourself as a team. So you can really sort of distill, what does it actually mean for us? We're in the, you know, pharmaceutical business. Uh, what, what have we learned from this great, uh, innovation? And I think the, the, the way that, uh, uh, back to your questions earlier on the way that it differs from innovation, but I mean, there's a lot of innovation, uh, uh in the, in, in digital transformation, that's what it's all about. 
But the way it differs is that you, it's not really a function or a department or an activity where you could put boundaries uh, for the reason I explained earlier on, that it's, you know, if you're truly trying to transform the business, then you should touch everyone, you know, from, from your manufacturing processes to your HR processes, uh, to your people themselves, uh, and so on and so forth. So that's kind of why it's a, it's a difficult endeavor. And, and I think you picked up on the leadership message, I think that that's what, one of the main founding, you know, we, we heard in the early days, uh, a lot of experts that were telling us that, you know, digital transformation will happen bottom up. Uh, yeah. you know, we had uh, bring your own devices, head edge innovation, and all the, all the people were, you know, going to innovate within organization and force the managers to change their practices. We found actually zero example of that, not one, uh, in the companies that we looked at, which was about, uh, 400. Uh, large organization. And so all of them, all, all the successful uh, cases we saw were really truly led from the top. It doesn't mean that it's not useful to have mavericks and, and people who try things within your organization, but unless it's really led from the top in a sustained way, it's very hard to see how you can be successful. Yeah. I thought that was an interesting point because, you know, a lot of people talk about the digital organization as one that is, you know, decentralized where an innovation in idea can come from anywhere and it can bubble up and everyone's in small two pizza teams and, and, um, you know, and, uh, the building blocks are all assembled and disassembled. And, and yet, um, in order to get to that place, you, you need this, this very, very strong leadership. And so I, I want to get into that. I want to get into your two by two, but, but before we move on from this idea of awareness, um, how is it possible? I mean, I know obviously everyone's aware at this point, but but how is it possible that people could take so long to kind of figure out which way the wind is, is blowing? I'm always, I'm always a little bit surprised and perhaps just because I'm in an educational institution and so I'm, you know, <laughs> constantly surrounded by a, a new, new batch of students every year. So I guess I, I get to see what's happening, but, but how is it possible that you can be in, in the senior leadership of an, of an organization? and, and be so, um, uh, isolated from the, the currents around you. Um, uh, you know, I remember reading a, a book many decades ago about the board of directors of General Motors, and they were kind of oblivious to what was happening in, in Japan. And, you know, is this just a dereliction of duty? Is it just that, you know, these people are old, <laughs> you know, like, look, I mean, you're in the business of education, you run these programs and, and, like how do, how do people ever get yeah. to the point where they are kind of head in the sand? How, how does that happen? And, um, and, and, you know, how can you build and I mean, if, if you've solved this problem, how do you make sure that the leadership team doesn't then sort of get comfortable with what their new creation looks like and, uh, and, and forget yeah. to figure out that this is a process that's ongoing. I, I think it's, it's, uh, you know, when, when it comes to the board, so we actually teach a program, which is digital for boards of, of, of directors. And, and, and what we find is a lot of these people are actually, although they may not be, so there's, there's surely, a, you know, I'm sure an, an age, uh, uh, concern there somewhere. Uh, but, but I don't think it's a main, uh, impediment. I mean, we've, we've seen some board members that come on our program that are incredibly curious. So, and I think that would be one of the key, uh, uh characteristics that I would put on a, on a good board member is just be curious, you know, go and, and, and dig out what's going on. I think the other thing that doesn't help is this, and, and this is different by country, but certainly in most country, you have this strong separation between the board of directors and the actual, uh, executive management. And I think if you want to understand the digital world, you need to, to reconnect the two because, you know, the board is supposed to actually maybe not design, but at least approve and vet the, the strategy of the enterprise, right. And, 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 and guarantee its survival. So, uh, so I think there is a duty, uh, for, for board of directors to really not only, um, uh, you know, look at it from afar, but really start investing, uh, and questioning management constantly about what they're doing on, uh, on digital transformation and, you know, monitoring progress and so on and so forth. And that's, uh, and I think some firms are, you know, are there already. I think the mistakes that was made in the early days, because of course there's a, the composition of the board is, is important is, you know, to do the usual 
let's go somewhere, uh, let's go hire somebody from Google and then we'll be done, you know? Uh, and, and we know that that didn't work over the years because many companies did that and, and that doesn't work. So you need to, to have a certain contingent of people on the board that are digitally savvy that can help the other, not the whole board because the, you know, boards have other, uh, uh commitments, uh, in, in terms of financials and, and, uh, auditing and security and so on and so forth. But, but you do need to have a contingent of people that are very aware of what this world is all about to, to really guide properly, uh, uh, a firm thing. Do, do you think boards in general are too, um, willing to take the assurances of the management team at face value, right? So, cause you know, a lot of people say that managers, their job is to be, their job is to create comfort for themselves, right? <laughs> their, their job is to, you know, build an environment where they can, you know, relax and, and uh, the board board's job is to kind of prevent them from ever relaxing, right? Yeah, is, yes. Is, is, yes. Do uh, boards kind of take things at face value too much? But so, some do, I'm sure. Uh, and, and very often it's because, uh, you know, they're being blinded by this tech talk that people throw at them. And, and there's some, that's what we teach on the course is basically, you know, what, what are the right question to ask your executive team, uh, in order to really uncover what they're truly doing. And, you know, if they come to you with, he's our new blockchain strategy, that's not a good start. You know, it's <laughs> just say, you know, <laughs> why, why are we doing this? What is a business problem we're trying to solve? And, you know, all this kind of questioning I think is, uh, is essential. Um, so, I, so I think that's, that's probably the, the reason. And then you have also differences by sectors. You know, there are some sectors that have been so, uh, 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 attacked or impacted by, by the digital world, like, like financial services, for instance, there are others in, you know, chemical processing, for instance, where, where it's taking a little bit longer. So I think there, there, there are differences in how urgent it is to, to really truly understand this, this field by, by different sector of industries. Now, I think you, you cite a statistic, I, I you know, the, you, I think you say 87%, but there's, you know, lots of different numbers being tossed around, but you say 87% of digital transformation initiatives fail to meet expectations. It is is that a problem of having expectations that are too high? Do, do, do we raise yeah, expectations I, too high or is it really a problem of, you know, a failure to implement or execute the, the transformation properly? I think a bit of both. I think people, uh, again, I think one of the problem there is people, the minute they make the investment in the technology thinks the jobs don't, right? And they tend to really underestimate the transformation part. So everybody focuses on the digital rather than on the transformation. Mm -hmm. And, and for anybody who's done a, uh, or, or looked at business transformation in organization, you know, it's, it's always the people in the organizational side, that's the most difficult to crack. And so people tend to have higher expectation, uh, or used to have a lot of high expectation about what this technology we're going to do overnight without really thinking about, uh, the adoption. You know, an example would be. Um, you, you know, if you remember the, the, the wave of corporate social networks that was going on, you know, with plenty of really good products that were on the market to do that. And it was kind of, let's do a Facebook within the enterprise kind of thing, you know, even Facebook is doing one. So, uh, uh, and, and that was basically launched very quickly and the idea and, and, and potentially, I think also what the vendors were pushing is, you know, you put this system in, in, in your corporation and you will see a lot more collaboration a, a amongst your employee. And of course, then came the deployment, the technical deployment of the tools and, and most firms that I see, and, and I've seen probably half of them succeeding and half of them failing. And the difference was, uh, the one who failed basically focused only on the deployment. So he was like, you know, okay, we've deployed the tool in 87 countries. Check the box. Yeah. Check the box. Do job yeah. done, right? Uh, and then you go and talk to the users uh, in these 87 countries and they say, well, what the hell is that? You know, is it replacing email? Is it, you know, what is it? And, and the company that did succeed are people that spend as much on the technology as they did on the adoption, which is basically creating community, having community managers uh, that actually on a daily basis manage that. So they put the investment on the adoption as well as the technology. And that really what, what made the difference. And I think we're seeing a lot of that in, uh, you know, in, in the so-called failure where, and, and, the, and the problem is, is that the, the expectations where, you know, you put the tool in place and that's it, you know, adoption will happen, you know, and, and we know that, uh, that, uh, this is not the way it works now. 
we've seen a big change, uh, which uh, out of the uh, unfortunate pandemic we've been through right now is that the adoption is actually uh, of these tools, at least has, has increased tremendously because uh, there's no other game in town, right? So, so even people that were highly resistant to productivity tools like, uh, like video calling or, 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 or file sharing or whatever, I, I've had to actually, uh, do that. But, um, but, but to generally, I think in the past, some of these mistakes were really due mm -hmm. to this, uh, uh, dichotomy between deploying the technology and getting it adopted. Uh, yeah. And, and, you know, the importance of leadership is, is cannot be underemphasized. And, uh, you know, if you're sort of a, um, if you're not a leader, if you're, if you're someone who's a, uh, contributor or, you know, lower down the organization and you're trying to, uh, proselytize for, for different tools, it's, 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 it's very difficult. I mean, I, I've been at a university for a long time and I mean, I spent probably six years trying to, seven years trying to get everybody to use Google calendar, trying to get everybody to use Dropbox, <laughs> trying to get everybody to use DocuSign. I mean, just Got like it. simple, simple stuff. And it, it's, and it's just, there's a, there's a, there's a level of resistance, which is just un, unfathomable. Um, and, and so you, you, but you talk about this idea of like, you know, the BYOD and mm. you, you mentioned the fashionistas in your yeah. two by two. And mm. you say, this is like a Christmas tree with lots of little, you know, orna <laughs> ornaments. <laughs> uh, and again, I would not be, I would be very disappointed if there wasn't a single two by two in, in, in your, in your book. So I'm glad you, you had this one, mm -hmm. but it was actually, it was, it was actually a very helpful one. Um, so maybe you could, you could walk through this, um, the, the, the kind of tech axis and, and the leadership axis and, and how, you know, where, where, where do you see companies now compared to where you saw companies back in, in 2014, in 2014, it was very clear that companies that, that did both the tech piece and the, and the leadership piece were outperforming the ones that, that did neither. Um, is everybody in the, in the upper right box now? I, you know, I don't think so. I mean, I, I, unfortunately I would say that, uh, you know, although you'd think as, as you mentioned earlier, uh, you'd think by, you know, we should drop the term digital transformation because everything in this is digital and everyone should be transforming. Right. But, but unfortunately that's not what I'm experiencing even today with some of the clients I work with are still struggling to put this transformation in place. And, you know, part of it is, is really more to do with the leadership and change side than it is with the technology. It's very rare that the, the technology just doesn't work or, or, you know, it happens that it's maybe too complex to implement or too expensive, but, but the, the main failures are, are usually on the second dimension, which is how do you actually affect change in, in your organization? And, and back to, to your question about the matrix, I think what we're seeing today, so we had beginners as a, at the bottom, uh, left corner of the, of the matrix, if you remember, I think we're seeing less beginners because uh, a lot of people have actually tried to do something. I mean, it'll be, it'll be, uh, 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 you know, hard to be oblivious to what's going on today, uh, given the amount of press that's, that's given to digital transformation, but there are still a few firms that, um, you know, are, are, are starting or have been fashionistas in the past, like, um, you know, um, basically fashionistas are the companies that are investing and, and putting all these shiny objects on the Christmas trees. Uh, and then the strategy is usually, you know, let a thousand flower bloom, uh, and then we will pick the stuff that works and we'll scale it. Right. And, and what you usually find is there's, you know, you end up with a thousand totally disconnected ventures, uh, mm -hmm. lots of duplication, uh, similar type application developed on different platforms. So it becomes a big, big mess basically. And, and a lot of these companies are restarting. So uh, I'm seeing a lot of, uh, <coughs> companies, excuse me, doing a sort of a digital transformation restart because they went down that route of saying, oh, we're very decentralized, let the business unit decide what they want to do. And then you end up with this, uh, uh, you know, spaghetti of initiatives that, that really don't make any sense for the business because as, as I mentioned earlier, if you don't have the, a very clear why you're doing it, mm -hmm. then it becomes just uh, experimentation, you know, and, and, uh, and, and there's a little bit of that. I mean, I, I have clients that are running, you know, two, 300 proof of concept at any one time. Um, the amount that actually gets scaled is very, very small, uh, because scaling is obviously the most difficult. And, and the problem is, you know, the, 
the business case is not in the in in, in the minimal viable product. The business case in the scaling part. So so if you never get to that scaling part properly, then then you know people people don't see a return, and very often you know the business managers don't see a return, and so they say, okay, we've tried it, it failed, it doesn't work. You know, so and then and then you're actually backtracking into your transformation rather than moving forward. Uh, and then we have these funny categories called the conservatives, um, which are people that are usually pretty good at the change side, uh, but they can't scale to the rest of the organization. And usually this is where the leaders are not strong enough to really push top down a, a, a formal program of transformation. Uh, and we've seen, uh, you know, companies, uh, I think in the book, we used Asian paint, which is a fantastic company. It's the biggest uh, coating company in Asia. And they did a, an amazing job in the supply chain, you know, every, every, everything that people would like to see in the supply chain, which is this visibility end to end. Uh, between supply and demand, but they could never scale that to other departments and other function and other processes. And it actually took a change of CEO to to make it happen. Um, so that's that's uh, so so you know beginners probably less than before. I'm still seeing a lot of uh, uh, a few conservatives uh, people that are are struggling to get their leaders or their leadership team engage into this transformation, seeing a lot of uh, fashionistas, probably more than, than what we had at the beginning of the research, uh, you know, that people that are resisting a little bit to put any programs and governance around, around their transformation and therefore end up with all these disjointed and disconnected programs. And, and, and I think the interesting question is, you know, do we have many more digital leaders than, or, or digital masters as we call them, uh, than we had six, seven years ago, I, I, I would suspect so, but, but, you know, it's not that many, uh, not that many, you know, in, proportionally, I would say. So I'm thinking if you're, if you're in the lower left and you want to get to the upper right, you know, what, what's the best path, right? Do you go through the fashionista path or the conservative so, path? And yeah, so that's the interesting thing. I don't think there is a linear path between all these boys. So in other words, you can jump straight from a beginner to a, uh, digital master. So a good example, which. I think we, we described in the book was Burberry, you know, Burberry was n not a technology company, uh, uh, not particularly, uh, brilliant at either change or not, you know, not technologist, uh, they're in fashion, but, uh, you know, Angela Ahrens at the time who was the CEO of, of, of Burberry did a tremendous job leading that transformation because although she wasn't a technologist, she really truly understood what, what was going on in the outside world and she was targeting uh, the young, uh, wealthy, uh, individuals and these people were using, you know, social media and things like that. So mm -hmm. she had to adapt to targeting that particular population. So there was a real business, uh, uh reason to do it. And, and she jumped straight from beginner to, to digital masters. I, I mentioned Asian paint who jumped from conservative straight into digital masters. Yeah. There are people who jump from fashionistas, you know, I mean, we, we use, and I use, uh, Nike as a. An amazing example, but I remember Nike back, back in the late 2000s was truly a fashionista. I mean, they had people doing social listening in the marketing department. They had people doing custom manufacturing with digital tools. There's a people doing CAD CAM and custom design in the design. It was all kind of disconnected. It's only when they created that digital plus units, which, which, uh, which sort of integrated all the digital skills that the sort of magic started happening for Nike. So you, so I think you can move from, you know, you can move to be a digital master from each angle, but then, and there's no, there's no linear path, if you will, to, that will take you from a beginner to a conservative, to a fashionista and to the others. But you do need a strategy to realize, you know, number one thing is, you know, realize where you are, uh, what the characteristic of your organization are, whether it's centralized or decentralized, and then put a plan together to actually move to the right, uh, to the right area. Well, so you've worked with uh, Capgemini for many years, and, and I think Capgemini is well known for its work um, around um, technology and IT, and uh, and it works very closely with kind of CIOs, CTOs within organizations. And, you know, one of the criticisms of IT departments, and you, in the book you talk about the alignment between the business and the IT, one of, one of the kind of criticisms of a lot of IT departments is that they're you know, they're, they're very conservative and that they're very, um, uh, you know, reluctant to, to add new tools, uh, perhaps part of its budgetary, but part of its process. And if, if we look at kind of the adoption of, of, uh, SAS tools 
in American companies that I'm more familiar with, um, it seems like the, the, the companies that went furthest quickest were the ones that kind of <laughs> did a work around the, the IT groups, right? So, you know, we think about something like a Salesforce or, or a Workday, and a lot of times these were just business units or functional areas that, that you know, got frustrated with, with I, IT groups. Um, so you, you talk about the importance of a, of a chief digital officer in, uh, in a lot of companies. So why, why is this role necessary, right? Why, why can't the CIO just be the CDO, right? What, what is it, what is this, what does it do when you create this new, new position, um, to kind of direct these yeah. efforts? I, th I think so on the, on the chief digital officers, I, I don't think you, you need to have a chief digital officer to succeed. I mean, I've seen organization where the, the sort of the traditional IT and the digital IT were actually part of the same unit led by a very transformative CIOs who did a, a great job. A dual, you have like a dual track IT. A, a dual track IT. And I think we had, you know, we had this debate, uh, over the last few years about this, um, uh, you know, dual IT. So you have a, a separation between the traditional IT usually focused on the back office, uh, and, and, uh, and at systems of record. And then you have this digital IT focus on all the fun stuff, which is to do with your customer experience, payments, and, uh, all, all this kind of thing. And, and I, I'm not sure over the long term whether this separation is actually sustainable because, uh, and what we've seen, you know, for the people who have done this kind of construct, you know, at some point, particularly now that data has become at the center of all these applications, at some point you got to get the data out from your customer bases and you're going to have to go and meet the traditional IT person, uh, and say, please, could you, uh, help me to connect that back to, uh, you know, the, 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 the standard system that we have or the databases and so on and so forth. So I think it's a bit, uh, you know, I've seen corporation dividing by back office and front office and, and most of these models are okay to start. So you, you get, you know, the momentum going, uh, but, uh, in the long term, it's, it's, it's very, uh, it, it's, it, it's, it's not clear to me whether that's a model that's sustainable and, uh, and, you know, to the people <clears throat> that were trying to go around, uh, it and, you know, I heard people saying, you know, we're going to do it without or despite it, uh, I, I think most of these people would have, uh, have failed, uh, over time because, you know, there is a technology component that is complex. We are talking about, or at least. In our research, we, we were talking to corporations that have got huge legacy systems, uh, that needs to be evolved, uh, and, and therefore the architecture of what you're building needs to be really, uh, thought through in combination. Now, th there are still problems between, and we've, we've lived through that in the last few years between the, you know, the old cascade process versus the DevOps and all, all this kind of stuff. And, 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 but I'm not sure it's, um, you know, I'm, I'm not sure necessarily uh, you know, if you have the right mindset in your IT leadership, you can probably cope with both. And I've seen a lot of people doing that. Now the CD, the, the chief digital officer can be very useful when, uh, the person is an accelerator of a digital mm -hmm. transformation, you know, and, and we saw, uh, and I think we documented that, uh, you know, Adam Broadman, when he was at Starbucks, for instance, did a fantastic job sitting between IT and marketing and, 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 and basically connecting the two and, and, and building a, a portfolio of, of, uh, IT solution of, of digital solutions that was extremely successful, uh, uh, over, over a large number of years, but it's not, you know, I've read too many papers saying, you know, unless you have a chief digital officer, you will fail. I, I don't think that's true at all. I mean, I, I, equally, I can, uh, I, I can't mention name, but I can give you two or three, you know, I have two or three example of people, uh, CEOs that were asking me, that were telling me, you know, I've just hired a, a chief digital officer because my IT and my marketing are fighting and. My answer was usually, oh, great. Now you've got three people fighting rather than two. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so, yeah. so I think it's not the panacea, you know, and, and I think if you look at the role over time, it's a role that is designed to disappear, right? I mean, yeah. some of the research we did at IMD shows that the lifespan of a CDO is kind of like two and a half years. So it's not long because you, you know, you could go a number of routes. You can either become a, uh, sort of the evangelist that no one listens to. 
you know, so you carry your PowerPoint deck uh, around the organization and, and no one's doing anything. Or if you're, if you're really going down the execution, then you need some decision rights, you need some budget, you need some staffing, and you also need extremely good interpersonal skills to connect with the business units. You know? and, and that's why whenever I, I, uh, I, I coach or, 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 or consult uh, some of my clients on building the digital team, I, I always say, you know, don't just hire the bright young people that understand everything about digital, hire some of the people that have been in the organization for 20 years. Uh, because they will learn a lot about digital, but also they will help you to maneuver through the organization from, from a political and emotional and, and whatever, whatever other angle. So you need this mix of people to be successful. I would say particularly in complex organizations that are highly decentralized, you know, where you really need to maneuver very carefully uh, through, through your digital transformation. I've always thought that within IT groups, you need to have sort of you know, anthropologists who really understand how, kind of how things work and, you know, what are the problems that people are trying to solve, uh, and, you know, really good listeners, uh, and process people. Then you needed someone who is really good with the numbers and who could figure out, you know, is this a make or a buy, right? Is it something we, we need to build or something we can procure and figure out all the different solutions that are out there. And then you need to have someone who can like do the integration and design the interface and create that internal kind of platform. And then you need people who are like educators who go back out and t kind of tell everybody like, okay, here's, here's what we now have and here's how you use it. And here's how you make great value out of it. But when you look at the kind of people that are hired into I IT groups, um, like the, you know, the anthropologists and, and the re recruit and the educators, you know, you don't see uh, necessarily a lot, a lot of people that are recruited yeah. for those skills. Yeah. And then even like the, the kind of the people who are good at assessing the, you know, make or buy decision, which is one that requires good accounting operations, finance skills, you know, those are often, often, often lacking. Do you think we need to kind of rethink the, the IT role as something that is, you know, less, less de-emphasize the technical and, and, and kind of re-emphasize the, 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 the business side and the, and the, and the people side? Yes. So I, I think, you know, we, 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 we saw a lot, uh, you know, when, when we looked at successful company, we saw a very different, uh, way of operating between the technology side and the business side. And, and the question, and, and I think you're totally right. I, I I'm a hundred percent convinced that if you take an area like uh, customer experience, for instance, if you want to do a, a really good customer or redesign your customer experience, you do need design skills, you do need the, the quants that are going to understand the numbers, you need integration skill, and, and you need anthropologists and people that have empathy with how a human being actually reacts to a certain situation, right? My, my question would be, uh, my question in answer to yours would be maybe I'm not sure whether you should put, you know, necessarily put that all in one department or mm -hmm. you should change the way you work. Uh, a little bit what these agile program are trying to do, you know, is through it. How do you build uh, multifunctional skills mm -hmm. as a natural way of operating within an organization rather than what we had before, which is where well, the marketing guys have got an idea and they're going to spec it and throw it all over the world to IT, right? Which we know is, is, is a problem that doesn't, is a, is a process that doesn't uh, uh, bode very well in the digital world. So I would, I would tend maybe to more emphasize, change the way you work and crack a problem with these teams that are put together to solve a certain business problem, and then disbanded, you know, go back to your own department. Now, I know when, 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 uh, and some companies are pretty good at that, uh, because they've really understood that agile and agility is not, not about just running an agile program, but about making your company and the way you work more, more agile. And, and, and this is, a uh, something that a few company have done, but those who have done it are, are you could see it in the, in the way they work, you know, he, he, even the language, you know, I mean, you put a, a marketing person and a, an IT person and a manufacturing person in the same room, and it'll take an hour before they figure out what a click through is or what, you know, I mean, there's a language issue that needs to be broken. And I think the firms that are most mature in digital, you, you see this ability to really put this, uh, uh cross-functional team together, um, you know, kind of self-forming around a business problem saying, okay, what kind of skill set do we need and having 
and and where the leadership comes in is is having the the ability to let these guys go loose uh, under control, if you will, you know. So to give me the objective, uh, you know, here's a budget, here's a timeline, and then let you know, let them go a little bit and and create and be innovative. And and you know, the, the problem sometimes is in the management processes. It's also in the leadership. You know, there's a lot of of uh, of leaders that are still in the kind of mold of operation that you know, if I don't control, my job is not worth it. You know, so uh, so I think that's that's really for me would be a better solution is rather than try to house all this skill set in uh, different um, uh, departments, if you will, to say, okay, the, you know, the quants will be in IT, the anthropologist will be, in, and, and the behavioral science guy will be in marketing. He's trying to say, okay, it doesn't matter, really matter where they are. Is can you assemble these teams quickly uh, uh, and have this, the ability to really assemble this resource pool to solve particular problems uh, very quickly. And then they can go back into their, their own. But it has a huge amount of HR implication as you can, as you can imagine. And, and I know a lot of the HR directors I've talked to about that don't like it very much because it, you know, it's like, who's the boss, who's going to do the review. And there's loads of micro problems, but I think it's a way to go. And I, I and if you look, if you observe, uh, you know, small to medium sized firms, this is how they operate. You know, they, they don't spend. Uh, you know, I've never met a startup that spend hours talking about the relationship between their IT and their marketing, for instance. You know? So, so I think mm -hmm. we ought to learn a little bit from that <clears throat> about the, um, you know, self-assembly of cross-functional team to solve specific problems and, and, and having this ability and agility to really be able to do that on a constant basis. Now, one of the things I liked about the book was you, you highlight some of the, um, trade-offs that are being uh, disrupted or challenged by these new developments. And, you know, when I talk about digital transformation, I often talk about how some of the trade-offs that we learn in a classical operations class are being upended, you know, whether it's EOQ models or use vendor models or all those, you know, traditional models where you have to, you know, trade off one bad thing versus another bad thing. But you, you highlight three of these. Uh, one is the standardizing versus empowering, controlling versus innovating and orchestrating versus unleashing and and those those three kind of trade-offs are ones that we talk about all the time in kind of organizational design in in business process design mm -hmm. and and you highlight that well you know we we can kind of now have have our cake and eat it too so to so to speak or at least you know the 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 the, the cost trade-off is now being kind of pushed downwards um and we can kind of get the benefits of of, of both I was wondering if you could, you could talk about that, maybe pick your favorite one <laughs> and explain exactly how it is that these trade-offs are, 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 are being upended. Yeah. I, I think it was, uh, you know, it came, it came to our, uh, to, to our mind really because looking at the traditional organizational, uh, academic, uh, uh, you know, papers and books that we've all grown up with and, and. The, the, it's really a story of opposition, you know, I'm centralized or decentralized, you know, I, I am controlling or, 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 or very, uh, uh, or leaving autonomy to the people. And, and I kind of, you know, we kind of challenged that when we start looking at companies that were, uh, doing digital transformation. Well, I'll give you an example. We, we worked with these, uh, uh, fantastic retailers in Japan and, um, they're really, when we start, so we talk to them a lot about organizational construct and design and things. And they say, look, it doesn't matter. They say, we leave total autonomy, uh, uh, to the people in the stores, because if the store manager was usually was a, you know, 30 to 40 year old, uh, person, if the store manager, uh, does something wrong, we will let him know within seconds because mm -hmm. we can see all the data. So, so right. and that's really one of the, uh, one of the answer is if your data flows are properly organized, you can actually let loose really easily because you never lose, you, you know, you're, you you mm -hmm. do not actually lose control. You know, in the old days, it was like, you know, let them loose and pray. Uh, today you don't have to do that. Right. You know, if, if somebody, uh, you know, somebody would have a dashboard. I mean, these guys are, they, they had dashboards about all the other stores in their area and seeing how much they were selling by categories. So they could course correct, say, well, I must be doing wrong. I must be putting the wrong thing on the shelves. So all the, you know, the information was, gave the ability to, to the management to really let, let loose, let these guys try, innovate, uh, change mm -hmm. things. But it wasn't about, 
uh, you know, let loose and pray. He was let loose and we right. can see what's going on, you know, and, and we can inform them about what's going on. And so I think there's a lot of, of that, uh, which is happening right now because of, because of this data flow that not all company are, companies are able to do that, but those who are, uh, I think are able to start changing the nature of their organization and how they, uh, give autonomy to people, uh, uh, in, in the field. And, and, and when that, when that works, I mean, as, as you well know, you know, the, the, uh, the autonomy also create job satisfaction, therefore retention. I mean, there's a whole pile of, uh, secondary effects in, in, in organization and people that is actually really positive. Yeah. The trade-off that we, we talk about a lot is, you know, rules versus go- rules versus discretion. And, and, uh, you know, you, one fun fact that I learned in the book is that the, um, origin of the word governance, uh, the original Greek word meant to, to steer. And, and I had forgotten that. Um, and so this is kind of like steering with it, with a loose rein, right? You know, exactly. you're keeping constant tabs on, on the horse. So you know where it's going and if it goes the wrong way, that's when you kind of, you know, jump in and, and, and do, do some steering, but you use this term over and over again, kind of digital, uh, governance. Um, you know, how, how do you, how do you think about that term? How, why, why is this so, so important? So governance, so we use that term, uh, primarily because people were too focused on project and program management, uh, in a very mechanistic way, uh, you know, using, you know, tools and how many tasks and it was just programmatic. And, and what we saw in the companies who were successful is there was a layer of, of management or governance, uh, whatever we call it, but the, the purpose was really to try to crack the standard or traditional uh, problems that all the organization have. So uh, as you know, when you're trying to uh, deliver a digital solution, as, as we discussed earlier, you need uh, IT people and operations people and a finance person, and you need to coordinate all these people that traditionally in organization sits in silo, right? And, 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 and I think the purpose of governance in a digital transformation is really to try, how do we make it easy to uh, cut across the silos, whether they're functions, geographies, or, or, or whatever else. And, and that's really something that really, um, I would say demarked the companies that did that well from the others. I mentioned, uh, Nike earlier on when, when Nike put all this skill set together, the people that do social listening with the people that are designing shoes to the people that can actually produce them, uh, in a factory, then suddenly you know, magical thing happened. Like, you know, uh, uh, you know, customizing shoes was, 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 uh, able to do that. There was a, a funny example. They, they, they told us about, uh, social lis- listening in, uh, in actually in, in South LA where the kids were stopped wearing laces, you know, and, uh, and it was a fashion, you know, every, all these kids were walking around with shoes without laces, uh, this took it off. And of course the manufacturing guy said, well, that's really easy to do, you know, let's try to do a, a few lines of this shoe. So this is. It's about how do you connect the dots between, you know, people that have got their, their ears out there, try to understand what the customers are doing and, and, and what they want and the people that can actually produce, uh, all of this. And, and, and I think that's to me, uh, a big key, uh, to, um, uh, to succeeding in this program is, is really try to have, to facilitate the problems that we have in traditional organization before we all become digital companies, uh, you know, mm-hmm. we're still organized in pretty traditional ways. Um, and in fact, I, I, I really believe, uh, and, and we're not there yet that, you know, the next wave of digital transformation will probably be much more about organizational innovation than it will be about digital innovation. Uh, and the reason I'm saying that is because of course the flow of technology will continue to happen. Uh, you know, engineers and inventors are doing their job of inventing stuff and they're doing a great job. So we'll see this continuous flow of amazing technology coming, but unless we start, uh, adapting our organization, it's going to become very, very hard to work, uh, efficiently and, and, and adapting meaning, you know, despite what everybody says, oh, you know, my organization is really agile, blah, blah, blah. You, you go inside the organization and it's pretty much the old structure, mm-hmm. uh, 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 you know, with the command and control, middle management, uh, filtering and so on and so forth. And I think that's, you know, if we want to go to this, uh, self-forming multifunctional team type of model that I'm describing, we, we need, we need to start changing that. Uh, and, and it's, a it's a big ask because, you know, you need the leadership that's, 
uh, wants to try, wants to experiment. Um, I am also not a great fan of this kind of, you know, everything will be flat. There will be no bosses and, you know, everything's going to happen. You know, that, that, you know, there are, there are, there are things that will remain like leadership, like, uh, you know, somebody want, you know, people want to have a boss and, 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 and some people would like, like to be told what to do. So, so that's not going to change, but I think the way we structure an orchestrate organization is, is going to be very different, uh, as are the kind of skill sets that we inject in various departments, you know, the. One other thing I saw in many uh, uh, organizations that over time, the marketing department changed from being 90% creatives to 90% quants, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> so still have a lot of creative skills, but the data became so fundamental to some of these businesses, particularly in, in B2C, but also in B2B, uh, that the skill set had to change. And if you think about what's going on with AI nowadays and, 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 and the ability to, to you know, optimize pretty much every process that we have in an organization. I think those skill set will start uh, meshing into not just the IT or, or whatever department, but into the skill set, the fundamental skill set of doing management in an organization. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree with you. I mean, I think if I, I was trained as an historian, and if you, you know, describe the history of the last couple hundred years, you can describe it in terms of oh, we have the steam engine and then we have electricity and then we have, you know, data centers and so forth. Or you can describe it uh, as, you know, the evolution of uh, firm structure, mm -hmm. you know, both kind of firm boundaries and how they, you know, vertical and horizontal integration happened, but then also in terms of the, the internal structure, you know, and the emergence of the M form organization and, you know, like DuPont and, and the, yep. you know, the Alfred Chandler writes about, and then, you know, the emergence of these newer forms. And, and so, you know, couple questions on that. First of all, with respect to the corporate organizational boundaries, you've emphasized that digital transformation begins with the customer and the understanding of the customer journey and understanding customer preferences. And then this kind of flows backward into the organization. But, you know, a lot of companies, they don't really have access to high quality first party customer data. You know, if you look at like CPG companies and so forth, you know, they're kind of flying blind a little bit. Is, is this, is, does this mean that, that they have to, you know, integrate in such a way that they can get access to the customer or do we, do we think that the, the current structure can remain, but there'll be like, you know, better information sharing. I mean, one of the things about Walmart that was so special, you know, 30 years ago even was that this information flow went back to CPGs and so forth. So are we going to. See, I talk about the data wars in my classes about how every company is trying to, you know, yeah. leapfrog the other companies to make sure that they're the ones that are sitting at the, at the mm -hmm. place where they can get the most data and integrate the data. Yeah. Um, how, how will corporate boundaries uh, have to change in order to get access to the, to the data that they need? So in a, in a couple of ways, I think the, so the, the, the problem you're describing is, is, uh, absolutely current and it's, a uh, fundamental B2B problem, right? <laughs> uh, uh, and whether you're in uh, car manufacturing, so where your resellers have got all the information about customers, whether you're in insurance, where it's your brokers that have got all the information, that, you know, or CPG, where it's all the retailers that have, uh, that the information is, is, a, is a very recurring uh, theme for, for uh, orchestration, for organizations. What, what, what I've seen is, um, so there's still a lot of people that are resistant because the way that it's presented is, uh, I'm going to start stealing your customers or I'm going to go direct mm -hmm. to customers to sell them the same thing that you're selling. Uh, but you know, and maybe even cheaper. So, uh, you know, your margins will be destroyed and your business will be destroyed rather. So, so kind of, a, uh, I would say, um, adversarial yeah, type of relationship yeah. between what, uh, what they're trying to do. And, and I think every time I've seen a, a small solution, it was more the opposite. It was more about, uh, and I've, I'm seeing that today in, uh, in a couple of, uh, car manufacturing companies where if you, you can imagine that they had very little data apart from doing the usual surveys or focus group and stuff, which we know the, the validity of is not a hundred percent. 
um, because the, the intermediaries had all the power, right? They had all the power and all the data and all the conversations, but unless you're Tesla. To, yeah, right. <laughs> uh, but if you think about even traditional car manufacturers, they are getting a ton of data now from connected cars, right? Uh, and they could have easily said, okay, well, now that we've got all the data, we got to go direct and who needs, you know, who needs to have intermediaries that basically all they do is show you the car in the showroom and help you to drive for 15 minutes. And then, you know, that, that's the value add. And, and they're actually doing something slightly different, which is to, to do more of a data integration with their intermediaries to basically say, you know, we have enough data to help you reduce your inventory, for instance. And, and I've seen these examples uh, already in practice today where the car company can actually tell a retailer, you know, if you're in South Paris, uh, you're most likely to sell black and gray cars, uh, engine size 1.6 to 2000. So don't bother stocking all these red and yellow cars because you'll never sell them. So you're actually helping the reseller to sell more. Uh, and I'm seeing that today in a, in a couple of insurance companies as well, where there are not trying to bypass the, the, the intermediaries. They're trying to help and connect their data with that of the intermediaries. So everyone can win because if, if the intermediaries sell more, when well, you'll, as a company will sell more. So that's more the model I've seen than, than the kind of adversarial, you know, we're going to try to take you on and, and go direct, uh, in, in B2B at least. Now, when it comes back to boundaries, the, you, the second part of your question, I think that's a big you, 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 by the way, I, 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 I'm not a historian, but I totally value the ability to look at long cycles, you know, where, 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 because of what we read in the press and things, everyone thinks everything's happening in six months and, you know, it changes things, but it's, it's sometimes useful to do, to look at history because what, what we found and what you've just described earlier on was like, you know, after every big technological shift we have seen a shift in organization. And that's kind of why I was saying earlier on, I think the next move is going to be more about uh, organizational innovation than it is about technology innovation, because we haven't quite seen that yet. And, and your example of the, you know, what happened when we moved from steam engine to electricity, well, you can take, you know, you can go online and look at old pictures of factory. You will see the factory shape has changed radically. Uh, because you don't need a single shaft to drive the whole factory and build up. Uh, you could actually decentralize the motors all over the place, which led to, um, uh, you, you know, the, 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 the sort of chains of, of production that we've seen and then uh, Taylorism and so on and so forth. So, so it led a complete revolution in the way that organization actually work. And I don't think we've seen that yet with digital. Uh, we're starting to see uh, uh, elements of it, like, uh, uh, you know, how a company makes decisions through data, uh, how you can augment an employee uh, through having a, a, a pile of tasks that, uh, that he or she used to do, replaced by, by uh, algorithm and, and so on. But, but we, I think we're, we're at the beginning of what this new shape uh, will look like. And it's very hard to, to uh, uh, you know, to figure out exactly what, what it, how it's going to pan out. But, but I think... That's the big movement I see over the next, you know, 10 to 15 years is, is really organization readapting the structures, uh, uh, and, and the management processes to be able to cope with this highly technology intensive way of doing business. Now you teach at, a, um, at IMD and IMD, you work primarily with, with executives, kind of people later in their, in their careers. Um, you also at one point advocate the, that some companies might want to create like a internal digital university to kind of educate their people, their managers about what it means to be a digital manager. Um, and you know, what exactly are the skills that you need to have to be a, a say a digital manager? Um, do the universities and the business schools need to kind of rethink their, their curriculum and how, how we teach things. I have a colleague who, who is a bit of a cynic and he says that the MBA model that we have right now is designed to, um, basically teach people how to run a 19th century railroad. And I think that's a little <laughs> harsh, uh, but, but, um, I think we've, we've made some progress since then, but, but, you know, what, what, what are some of the, what are some of the, do we, how do we need to teach people different, uh, differently at, at the kind of undergraduate or business school level so that they, they can be prepared for these changes, uh, and, and that they don't need to be kind of re-educated, uh, kind of later on. 
So I, I, so I, I, I think so. I'd, I, I wouldn't be as harsh as your 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 commentator. There. I think you know the universities have been a school are making progress in terms of the the teaching and and the way we teach leadership and management and and transformation and so on and strategy. Uh, because there are, you know, there are fundamental changes. I mean, you know, I, I grew up with with Michael Porter, uh, as you probably did. Uh, uh, so we had a, you know, we had a very industry structure vision on how you actually craft strategies. Well, you know, uh, I'm not saying this is not uh, useful anymore. I mean, it's, it's 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 very useful. But if a business school carry on teaching only that, uh, I think you're probably in a dark age because the notion of an industry can be challenged. I mean, take Amazon as just one example. Uh, the notion of value chain can be challenged because most companies are moving more to ecosystems. And this is the boundary story that, that we, we were talking earlier on. Uh, most of the, uh, uh, you know, source of, uh, uh, value was either differentiation, uh, and better or low cost and cheaper. Well, you know, Uber is both cheaper and better in my book, at least in London. Mm. <laughs> uh, so, so, and and, and, the, 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 and the the advantage has moved more to scale and networks and data uh, and analytics. So, I think a lot of the stuff that you know, that I I must admit that when I when I first looked looked at this field as uh, as an economist, I would just say you know people were talking about the digital economy, the new economy, and I was saying. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know the fundamentals of of the way the world work are, are, are remain the same, and I've, I've kind of changed my mind a little bit because uh, I think if you look, if you scratch below the surface, of course, you know there are rules that are still valid. So network effects are nothing new. I mean, we've known that for for years, but they are being applied today uh, in, in incredible way by by certain. Uh, platform uh, owners, uh, the the notion of industry is being challenged in pretty much every old industry, um, and particularly from from new entrants. Uh, even valuations. I mean, you know, I I grew up. Uh, I did my stint in M and A, and you know, it was like uh, you know DCFs, and then you did uh, asset pricing, and then you mm. know. The usual, okay. You added, a, <laughs> you know, the the the, the premium on it that uh, that ju you know, justified by the brand or whatever. But today, like you know, how do you value these companies on assets? I mean, it's impossible. I mean, you know, the, the asset is a piece of software and uh, and the client base, and and mm -hmm. and so I think you're still valuing the future uh, earnings and growth and things, and and with that comes the the situation we're in today, where. Uh, you know, if I, 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 I don't envy VCs very often because, you know, if you look at what they're doing, the, the successes are always the thing that people talk about, but as we know, uh, and you're, you're in the right, uh, part of the world to, to, uh, observe that on a daily basis, many of these people never make it. Uh, it's like when we, you know, all my clients wanted to become digital platforms and I say, guys, probably maybe, maybe not, you know, your, <laughs> you know, your chances of succeeding, these are very difficult and very expensive things to do. And there are successful platforms today that probably will never make a dime in their entire existence. So, you, you know, so, so I think we're, we're still, uh, to some extent learning. Uh, I think we're, we're, we, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty much convinced that some of these basic, uh, economics and, and I think ways of thinking about strategy needs to evolve and therefore. Uh, business school and university needs to adapt, uh, but I, I still think we, we're we're learning a lot about uh, uh, you know the the way that the economics of this platform work, and, and sometimes we're learning the hard way. You know, hence some of the uh, fluctuation in valuation that's, that's going on in some of the uh, in some of the so-called tech stocks, um, which sometimes are very physical stocks called that calling themselves technology companies, you know, uh, so, so I think that's, that, uh, that, that to me is, uh, is the most important thing is really to realize that, you know, there are, there is an evolution happening. Um, and there are, by the way, fixed points that, that people forget, you know, I mean, like where you, you mentioned anthropology still your own, I mean, you know, generally behavioral science is still as important or should be still as important as it ever was because human beings are still human beings, right? So we've changed the platforms, we've changed the economics, we've changed the industries, but 
at the end of your, whether you're in B2B or B2C, at the end of the chain, there is a human being that still has emotion and, and feels happy in the morning or unhappy or, 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 uh, you know, or, or whatever. And, and these, these, this uh, soft side, uh, which are actually the hardest thing, uh, need to be understood, uh, through science, not just making it up. Uh, and that's also where I think we will see a, a lot of evolution in understanding is because traditionally this, uh, this uh, science uh, to do with behavior was very often through observation uh, and and uh, and you know direct observation and you know focus groups a good example of that. I think today the data is giving us the ability to do to understand what people are doing, how they're using our products, uh, how they're behaving without even doing any observation because the the the, the real time data is actually telling you uh, exactly what's going on. So I think that's the kind of reason why, um, you know, I was talking earlier on about this change also of capabilities within certain department, like marketing is a good example, where you need to also adapt to what's going on in the world out there, because it will demand very, very different capabilities. Now, my old school, uh, at one point in the late nineties, created a, uh, e-commerce major uh, and, uh, tried to create like an e-commerce department and they very quickly got rid of it because they realized that, well, you know, that's pretty much commerce. Right. And, um, you know, you mentioned that, you know, digital marketing, well, that's just, that's just marketing. marketing. Um, do you have, uh, a planned, uh, plan for obsolescence at the global center for digital transformation at, at IMD? Do, do you think that, you know, 10, 20 years from now that this, this center will cease to exist because it's, it's just going to get folded into kind of. Yes, the, I, the, the normal way of doing business, you know, management, marketing, operations yeah, and so forth. I hope so. I hope so. Because that would mean that, uh, most companies have actually reached a, a, a level of maturity where, you know, the very notion of, of digital transformation as a program disappears because that's the way you do normal business. I, I think we're still pretty, uh, a pretty long way uh, from there. And. Um, I would dream to transform the center into a, you know, organizational innovation center, uh, where we can start figuring out, okay, now that we've got, uh, all these people sort of tooled up to, to, uh, to, 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 with their digital transformation, how do we actually get them to move as organization? How do we get them to move as leaders, uh, of, of people, uh, and, 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 you know, there are. There are plenty of, of issues that, that, uh, I think university uh, are not all tackling today. Like, you know, we, you, again, back to your, your very valid point about changing boundaries. I mean, how many times, you know, do I still see executives being very uncomfortable when they have to work with somebody who's not on the payroll, right? <laughs> uh, and, or groups of people that are not on the payroll and guess what, you know, that's. I mean, in the United States, it's reaching a level that's significant, you know, 15 uh, and above percent of the people are actually, that works for your organization and help you deliver your solutions are actually not on your payroll, right? Mm. Uh, I think this is going to increase tremendously uh, for two reasons. One, because a lot of the skill set I was describing earlier on is still today rare and expensive. Uh, so it's a better business, uh, decision to, to hire them. Like, like we hired lawyers, right? I mean, we've, we've kind mm -hmm. of, uh, lawyers have had bad press cause they're, you know, uh, expensive and, and, and there are not too many of them and of good ones at least. Uh, and so you, so you hire them on tap. I think we will see, uh, this model being developed for other sources of talents, uh, and therefore leaders need to feel comfortable, you know, having this kind of contingent workforce that may work for your company for six months and then they go do something else, uh, and, and, and learn. And, you know, there's loads of issue around security and IP and all sorts of stuff. But, but I think that's the direction of travel in terms of, of how organization will, will kind of develop, uh, this kind of skills. And then, and I think universities, you know, back to your, your question, we cannot continue to think about the marketing department, the finance department, the, uh, whatever strategy department, because we know that the, the business problems are themed, right? So digital transformation is a good example. I mean, to actually teach digital transformation, we have cybersecurity people, uh, uh, you know, people who are focused on certain geographies like China, we have, uh, economists, we have, uh, uh, HR and behavioral people, you know, just to 
give the student the feel for what it takes to actually transform these organizations. So, and, and I think most business problem will be like that. I mean, take uh, AI today. I mean, you know, it's not just about the technology and, and, and the people who build algorithms, you know, it's got loads of implication for how we run organization that needs to be tackled in this kind of cross-functional. So I think we need to reflect the way we're seeing those trades in businesses back into at least business schools. I'm not, you know, I'm not saying every university, but at least for the business school that pretends to help leaders uh, lead better, uh, you know, we need to integrate that and, and, and design programs that are much more cross-functional and, and versatile than, than what we had in the past, you know, like a marketing program or whatever. Well, I certainly agree with that. DDA, uh, plenty of food for thought here. Um, this book, Leading Digital, still around. And also on your website, uh, IMD website, plenty of other additional material that you've there is. written. <laughs> and here we go. This is, a galley. this is a galley copy. So <laughs> it's All right. just, I just well, received we'll have to that get today. that one. <laughs> this is Unsilo brought to you by Alumni FM, connecting people through stories. 